All right, and this is being recorded, so um, whoever got the $50, I'm sure you now have to report that on your taxes and, 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 and all of that. So we're almost there. We're at the very end. I don't see anyone asleep, and honestly, I'm not sure how you could. I think these seats are optimized for maximum alertness, if you know what I mean. Um, someone actually told me that they did that on purpose, so that the students here would, would, would stay awake. Um, and I actually think that um, uh, you all have been doing amazing things with that alertness. The presentations today have all been fantastic, um, and I've also been perched up there at the top for most of this, so I've seen all the productive things you've been doing, a lot of slack going on, um, actually a lot of development, um, which is really impressive, but one of the most impressive things is that there have been some people that have been catching Pokemon during <laughs> the session today. It's, it's true, it's true. And, and the most impressive thing about that to me um, is that given our location and the topic, I'm sure there's a high proportion of fire Pokemon here with us today. Um, and for those of you that don't know Pokemon, that's actually a thing. There are fire Pokemon. Josh is shaking his head no. So, so you've actually tested it? Is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, I didn't realize. Did, did it have an H in it? <laughs> uh, so uh, you'll have to check it out yourself. You'll have to check it out yourself. You'll have to prove this. Their marketing prowess knows no bounds. All right, so we're going to talk about something meaningful, hopefully, now. Um, now that I'm awake, I've gotten my wiggles out. I get punchy in the afternoon, I think. Um, so my name is Ricky Bloomfield. Um, I'm a physician at Duke and also do um, some techie stuff uh, like, like most of you here. Um, and it, it's been very exciting to see this journey um, over time. And I think that we've all had problems that we've needed to solve, which is what brings us here. And I think we like and really enjoy solving problems. Um, and how more meaningful could it be to solve problems that help patients take better care of themselves and help providers take better care of patients? And so that's why I got into this. Um, I, I was a resident at uh, UNC, the lighter shade of blue, um, and <laughs> that, that's not supposed to be funny, but I guess it is, um, <laughs> depending on which side you're on. Um, and, and I recognized lots of problems at the time, and I ended up getting into iOS app development. Um, and when I finished my residency, recognized that there was a lot that we needed to do to help these new things we called apps connect to um, where the data is. And so when I joined Duke in 2013, our goal was to create an infrastructure that would allow these apps to easily connect. And we started building that, and within 12 months, we had an infrastructure up that used REST, um, used um, OAuth, and we had an Android sample app that was pulling data directly out of Epic. We thought, this is great, this is fantastic. And then I learned about Smart and Fire, um, and got in touch with Ken and, and Josh, and immediately we realized, we don't want to recreate the wheel here. That's not our goal. Our goal is to meet the needs of our clinicians and our researchers, and so immediately we pivoted, changed, um, and it didn't require that much modification to change the infrastructure that we had created to be um, smart and fire compliant at the time, DSTU-1. And so that's, in a nutshell, um, where, where I'm coming from. And Duke, as, as uh, many of you probably came or if you're at a health system, you know, maybe your health system had a lot of flexibility in doing what they needed to do, and Duke had a homegrown EHR prior to moving to Epic, and we wanted to make sure we retained our ability to innovate. Everyone wants that autonomy um, to be able to do cool stuff, and so we felt that this was one way that we would be able to preserve um, that autonomy, and, and, and we were very excited about it. I'm not gonna get too technical today. Um, I think it's more fun just to show um, demos. Um, and, and we've actually submitted a paper that has a lot more technical detail about what we did in our implementation, but this is as detailed as I'm gonna get as far as the technical impl uh, implementation of what we did, and I'm jealous of uh, Sam's architecture diagram from earlier in the day with the spinning gears. I think that would make my presentation complete, so I might need to steal that from you. Um, <laughs> But uh, essentially what we did is, is create everything that we needed, um, uh, the, the, the fire server as well as, as well as some apps, and the server in the middle, the green part, handles rate limiting, it handles the authorization of course, auditing, logging, and any uh, analytics that we needed um, to do there. And then on, on top of that, we could run a number of apps. We actually have in production now some smart apps. We also have the, the legacy app thing. Basically it was a use case that we had from, from pre-Epic, pre-Fire, um, that needed to get some patient demographic data, and so we put a little fire wedge in there to make that uh, still work even after that transition, which we're using. And we've also demonstrated iOS apps and um, hopefully some Android apps in the future. 
Um, and then, of course, underneath uh, uh, the, the, the layer we have, we had to build in support for the fire resources that we needed to use at the time. We certainly haven't built everything yet, um, but we've built the things that we've needed, which requires um, uh, custom coding with Cache, you, uh, either using um, Cache directly with an Epic or using the Epic web services and building a wrapper on top of that. There are a number of ways you can get to that data, but in the end, the app, of course, doesn't know. It just, it just speaks the fire language, and that's all that matters. So I want to jump into the, um, into the good stuff. Um, it, it seemed that when Smart and Fire um, started uh, taking off, most of the demos, most of the apps were provider-centric. And I think it, that, that, that seems natural. As providers, you want to solve your own problems. Um, and so our initial implementation of the work that we did was also um, provider-centric. And um, I, I think this is the app that's been shown more than any other, so I'm not going to belabor um, what the growth chart does. Kudos to Boston Children's for having uh, put this out there and, of course, making it open source. Um, I think that people use it because it does show immediate value and we have understanding of what it does and why it's important. I'm also a pediatrician, and so I like um, to do things for the kiddos, um, and so we wanted to, to, to do this as well. And so our goal was to demonstrate that we could integrate this into Epic, and we had the 2014 version of Epic, not the 2015 that comes with uh, some fire resources, um, showed that we could integrate this seamlessly um, into the desktop EHR, and, and that's what we did. We, we had this functional in our proof of concept environment in January of 2015, so about a year and a half ago, um, and it was in production um, later that year, um, about a year ago. And of course, we didn't want to stop there. We wanted to show that we could also integrate the same app using the same infrastructure um, in multiple environments. So in addition to desktop, we also showed that it, it could be integrated into the Epic mobile apps. So this is Canto and then Haiku, um, the iPhone app. And as you can see here, um, pediatric growth charts, as great as it is, isn't quite optimized for mobile. <laughs> Um, so it's not what we call a responsive design, and Rick and I were just uh, commiserating or just discussing um, that uh, a few minutes ago. And of course, th those are things that can easily, well, they can be changed, um, and, and, and I think they will in the future. But we, we just wanted to show that it, it worked, we could get the data, we could handle the authentication, um, and that we could put it uh, in, in meaningful places. And then uh, we also showed that we could have a completely native app. Also, kudos to Boston Children's and uh, Pascal for his work on the iOS app which uh, he, he gave us the code for. He had created, I think he said, about 200 lines of code. He converted his, his non-Fire app into a Fire-enabled app with the library that he had written. Um, and we were able to connect that directly to our proof of concept environment, pulling out the same exact data um, that the web app did. So I'm gonna jump into um, a video. And these have been slightly edited um, to meet Epic's requirements for public demonstration. Um, so this is a pediatric growth chart, as you've seen. It was launched directly from hyperspace. And you can see that, obviously, this is a much more meaningful view. No one wants to see a tabular format, as Scott uh, mentioned earlier. And then, of course, the parental view, which I'm going to show you again um, a little bit later. And then switching gears, uh, the next app that we integrated was Medication. And Lori uh, talked about this earlier. Um, and, the, and just to, I'm going to pause this. Um, in, in choosing which apps we wanted to demo first, we wanted to choose one that was open source, one that was proprietary, and then one that we created ourselves. We wanted to show uh, some sort of spectrum of applications here. And of course, this is pulling the medications directly from Epic. And, and, and the value of this uh, is to show a, a very simple view of your medications, of course, in multiple languages um, that, that uh, the, the current EHR doesn't necessarily support so that we can meet our patients' needs. And then the third app that we demonstrated was called Duke Pillbox, also pulling medications from, um, from Epic. And then I'm not gonna give you $50 for scanning this QR code. <laughs> um, but the reason we did it this way, so this is integrated into the, the, the desktop EHR environment. It's designed to be a patient education tool, so at, at the, during the discharge process, the nurse um, can pull this up um, and, uh, scan this QR code with a tablet um, that has actually a, a web app with, a, with an iOS shell, which I'll show you in a second. And this QR code actually contains 
all of the medication information that you just saw. And by doing it in this way, our information security office was happy because we weren't logging into Epic and then handing that tablet to a patient, um, which it, for obvious reasons isn't something we wanted to do. Um, but rather, we could pull all that data directly into this tablet with no connection to the EHR whatsoever um, in a more secure way. And so that was the reason we, we, we went this path. So um, you'll see that right here. You'll see the iPad. Um, open this up. And then it will scan um, the same QR code that you just saw, pull that information into this app, and then the user can drag and drop um, his or her medications into the right um, box. Again, um, you can see how this could be used as a teaching tool um, as part of the discharge process. And here we only have five medications. I've taken care of patients with over 30. Um, so obviously that would be a little bit of work, take a little bit of time, but those are also the patients that need this type of practice. Um, the other thing that this does on the back end, it actually records all these interactions so that the nurse can look and, and, and look at a replay of what happens and see where the patient had trouble. And then they can target that um, area for education. The last thing I wanted to show you is, um, again, these same apps um, all worked on the mobile interface. Uh, so this is Canto. And so this is, again, growth charts. So I'm not going to belabor this. And then in a second, I'll tap on charts for iOS. And what we did here was we were able to launch directly from the Epic iOS app, passing in the right context to the native uh, mobile app. And of course, you got to log in with your fingerprint just because that's the cool thing to do. Um, and then with that patient context, I'm able to pull up, again, the exact same um, data that's right there. All right. So moving on from provider-centric, um, which was the first thing that we did, there are more and more reasons now, and I think even more excitement about the patient-centric use case, wanting to enable patients to give them power over their own data, and I totally agree with that, uh, and I think I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, and so we, we had a number of use cases, a number of people who wanted to come to us uh, to integrate their apps into MyChart or the Epic Patient Portal, and we said, yes, let's please do this together. One of the first was um, done by Jeff Ginsberg, who leads our Center for Personalized and Precision Medicine at Duke. They developed an app called Mitri um, that was recognized at the White House Champions of Change in Preci Precision Medicine event about a year ago. And this app, I'm not going to go over all the detail, but basically is a tool that helps gather a high-quality family history from patients. And then um, has, they have, I think, 15 different algorithms they can predict risk based on your family history. And to be honest, physicians do an abysmal job collecting family history from users. You know, if someone comes in with an acute uh, infection or with a broken bone, they don't care about your, you know, five-generation pedigree. But the reality is if we can get this information, we can do some really cool stuff with it. And this is what Jeff's group has demonstrated. Here's some additional screenshots of that. All right, so now we'll move into the patient demo. This is logging into MyChart, and you can see the standard Epic uh, MyChart functionality here. We'll go into the, again, pediatric growth charts, which, um, which you've seen, I think I've shown you about five times already. Um, and the other thing that we did here, in addition to showing that we could launch these apps directly from the patient context, um, was we also wanted to show that we could write back into the EHR, which isn't something a lot of people are doing yet. And so you can hear I'm correcting the height of the mother. She's actually um, 185 centimeters tall, and the father's actually about 160 or so. Make sure we get that right. Um, and then these values will be saved back into the EHR, and this is using the family history resource. So we added write capability for the, fa uh, for the family history resource um, in here, and, and obviously could extend that to others. Um, this is still in our proof of concept uh, environment, and we hope to move this into production uh, later this year. And uh, just quickly, this is showing uh, a very similar thing. We've created a custom Duke uh, MyChart app um, that uses the Epic infrastructure, but it's branded um, according to um, Duke's branding guidelines. And you can switch to the proxy patient here. You can see the pediatric growth chart button in the lower right-hand corner. And again, loads the minuscule pediatric growth chart um, right here. All right. Uh, you, you don't want to see more growth charts. You've seen enough growth charts. All right. So just to summarize uh, this piece, um, at, at Duke, we implemented Smart and Fire Server on Epic 2014. Um, we enabled provider-facing apps um, via the desktop EHR, um, patient-facing apps on the patient portal, and then write support. And we're, we're, we're hopeful that we'll continue to push this along. We're, 
we get requests for additional fire apps all the time, um, and our goal is just to meet those needs. So there has to be one more thing, of course. I was hoping I'd have a couple minutes. Because um, you have to have fun with this stuff too, right? Some, one person said yes. I don't know how the <laughs> rest of you feel. Um, all right. So um, you, we have use cases that come up all the time. Uh, and, and you know, how can we improve what we do? And one of, the, one of the itches that we've been meaning to scratch for a while is related to uh, consenting our patients. And Duke had been working a while trying to get these Topaz tablet little things where it costs like $500 for this little thing you've seen in the grocery store before. Um, and so we said, well, what, what could we do with, um, with Smart and with Fire? And this, I think, is a testament to the power of the tools that are out there already, many of which have been demonstrated today. So this is an app that I wrote over a weekend, and it was only possible on that timeline, number one, because I'm insane, um, and <laughs> Josh thought that was funny, and number two, um, because of all the great work that Josh has done uh, and Pascal have done to create libraries that make it that simple to do. Um, this would have taken months um, without, without that type of um, infrastructure in place. So what I'm gonna do here is log in, if the internet will work, um, into the sandbox, the Smart Health IT sandbox, It'll pull up a patient list here. Um, everyone chooses Brittany Ackerman because her name is at the beginning of the alphabet. Um, and what this is, is a list of consents that I'm pulling from just a public server that I've created a bunch of JSON objects. Um, it logs in using Smart and Fire, identifies the patients, and then shows these uh, consents either for research or clinical. Um, but what we thought was at the time, um, there's great UI that exists already for doing consent. So what this does is it pulls down the, this consent and actually displays it according to Research Kit, which I think many of you are familiar with. Um, and so you can go through the Research Kit flow. We keep your data secret. Um, and I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. I think you've seen Research Kit. If you haven't, I encourage you to go out there and look at it. Again, an open source framework that we were able to easily pull down and integrate. Um, and I can show you, you know, those that have been done already. Um, you know, the PDFs are here. And so obviously this is just a proof of concept. It's not yet um, fully integrated into our EHR. But again, it's a testament to the tools that have been created by fantastic people um, to make our lives easier. And I think that's what this type of event is for, to share knowledge and help us collaborate. So many things today have been, uh, that have been shared with us are open source. Obviously, Fire is open source, Smart is open source. And I think that degree of collaboration is what makes us all more successful. And so I wanted to show that because uh, I wanted to highlight how valuable this community is and what it enables us to do. And hopefully we can make this into something useful for, um, for Duke and maybe others as well. And uh, that's, oh, it stopped. That's all I have. So um, I st still don't think we're taking questions, but um, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>